Hello, everyone. I am Peter Finley from Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. It fills me with great excitement to share with you the creation of this 1931 Chrysler wood model. I have always been making wood carvings, turnings, models, toys, furniture, etc., etc. Fido was my first carving at age 10 with an exacto knife and a block of construction spruce. Throughout high school, wood and metal shops, along with art, produced my highest marks. A three-year diploma in furniture and interior design at Ryerson provided a solid foundation for my woodworking career. 20 years in the furniture industry with various roles related to product engineering, development and design, followed by 20 years as a wood technology professor at the Woodworking Center of Ontario at Conestoga College, Kitchener, Ontario. And I taught materials, AutoCAD, product engineering, product design development, and history of furniture styles. All of this prepared me for the incredible opportunity to create this Chrysler model out of wood, my favorite material. I would now like to share how the idea and concept for this project came about and share with you some of the things I learned along the way. And here is the completed Chrysler car model. And, and leading up to this project, uh, I made several inter interesting projects which prepared me for that. Uh, this is a spinning stool, which was made out of basswood, which was light, strong and carvable. It doesn't have any arms because the spinner has to be able to pull her arms back beside the narrow back. This uh, Victorian gun cabinet was a uh, project I also made just before the, uh, the car. Uh, it was made for the Woodside National Historic Site. This uh, Carving here is a uh, Chippendale mirror crest, which I uh, made with a master carver in Frankenmuth, Michigan. Uh, both of these projects, the, uh, the wood crest and the gun cabinet, I had parts of it at the uh, Woodstock Wood Show, October 1996. And this is where uh, I, I was showing these two parts to advertise a, a carving class I was going to teach at the college. Well, while at that uh, display, a gentleman came up to me and said, Peter, he didn't know my name, sorry. A gentleman came up to me and said, I would like you to make a carving of my Chrysler Imperial 1931. I looked at her and said, I don't do cars. Now that became the famous last words. Uh, he said, but you could. And I said, I suppose, but it could take a long time. So, and it could cost a lot of money. So, and that was the end of our discussion. And uh, I said, there are many other carvers you should go and see at the wood show here who would be quite capable. And he handed me his business card and said, Peter, I would like you to come to my house and see my car. So I waited a few weeks and then I, uh, my students were saying, Peter, you really must do that project. And my wife wasn't really excited about it, uh, but I phoned him up and said, uh, I'm ready to come and see the car. And he said, well, when can you come? I said, tomorrow morning at seven o'clock on the way to the college. Uh, I went to his, what I call his showroom, where he has this huge collection of uh, uh, antique classic cars. Uh, the one in the forefront is the Chrysler Imperial that he wanted me to do the carving. And I was struck by it. It really impressed me. It had all the details of an Al Capone car and it just, uh, it, it grabbed me really quickly. And then he said to me, I want it to be to scale. Now, I worked in the furniture industry and all my training, everything that I did were very exact mechanical drawings to scale. So that was no problem. 
He said, I want it to be the quality of furniture. Well, working with high quality companies like uh, Electro Home and House of Braymore, I understood what furniture quality was all about. And I'd like it to be art. Well, I enjoy art. And I immediately realized that all the different species of wood that I would be using would be my pellet that I would be uh, working from. Then we talked about the time and he said, uh, how long will it take? I said, five years. He said, I don't have five years. I said, well, sorry, I'm a full-time professor. I, I don't have much time during the winter to work on it. Uh, and he said, well, I suppose as long as I see progress. And then he, he said, uh, what's it gonna cost? And uh, I put some thought into that and I gave him my number. And he said, oh no, that's twice as much as I'm willing to pay you for it. So that was the end of the discussion and I went back to the college. And then I realized that if I, if I uh, donated the money he gave me to the college for a bursary, uh, then uh, that would double uh, the value of it. And because the government at that time was matching. So if I put $1,000 in, the government put in 1,000. So this gave me a reason to, uh, uh, to continue uh, at the price that he had offered. Uh, so now, now that I've taken on the job, where do I start? The first thing I, I did, because when you look at it, it's kind of an overwhelming project. How, how do I get a hold of this thing? But uh, past experience told me that once you take on something, there's a process of working through it. So I listed all the parts and you see all the parts there on the screen, uh, the mascot right down to the body. There's even the, the keys are listed on there as well. I ended up carving the car pretty much in the order of my list of parts here, because it's very important to be working on one part at a time. Otherwise, uh, one is gonna have a nervous breakdown very quickly. So the question that always comes up is how long did it take? And my log shows 1,500 hours. In reality, probably over 2,000 hours, over a five-year period. After 50 years of playing with wood, it's the 50 years that's important of all the things I learned and all the projects that I made and the things I taught at the college uh, provided me with the understanding and the skill to be able to take on this project. It's 172 different components, uh, counting lefts and rights, and 438 separate pieces of wood. This is the drawing, it's done manually. Uh, I did the wheels with AutoCAD. I was teaching AutoCAD at that time, uh, but AutoCAD wasn't uh, developed enough to be able to do all the curves and things that I had to do. So the drawing is uh, a quarter scale uh, and uh, 52 inches in length. In order to, uh, to do this, I, I measured full size parts from the car. And then using a scale ruler, I transferred, transferred from full scale to quarter scale. And many individual part drawings, patterns and templates were also created. Uh, so wood, wood as art. It's all about the material selection, uh, color, grain, texture, natural wood color, penetrating oil finish, uh, and no, no uh, stain or, or paint. I, I have a, a passion uh, for wood. Uh, wood is a creative adventure from design to construction details to making each part. I get excited when I am selecting the wood for each part of my project. The challenge is to search out the species with the most suitable grain, color, and character. Wood is an amazing material with unlimited possibilities. In the course that I, I taught of materials, uh, we talked about the characteristics of wood. And you must understand wood before you can use it intelligently. That was a quote by Frank Lloyd Wright, a very famous American architect. Wood is 
and isotropic, uh, which means it has different properties along each axis. So if you look at these three pictures here, the end grain is very different from the face grain and the edge grain, and they each have different uh, characteristics, the grain, uh, compression strength, and shrinkage. Wood is hygroscopic. Hygroscopic means that wood will take on and get, uh, give off moisture according to moisture changes. And wood always shrinks or swells across the grain, uh, not the length. This is something we'll talk about later. Uh, density is also an important characteristic. There's a huge density difference between pine and oak. And it, it really defines the hardness and, and the weight, whether a piece of wood is going to float or whether it's going to sink. Visualizing the wood grain relationships. Uh, you'll see the woods here as I purchase them uh, and the yardstick indicates the scale and the size of all of this. And then as I cut the parts out, I piece them together to try to visualize the, uh, the grain and the relationship between one part and another. The first part that I, I did was the mascot. Uh, in order to do this, the uh, gentleman I was working with uh, gave, loaned me a, uh, cast uh, yeah a cast model sorry let me do that again the gentleman loaned me a mascot that was cast in stainless steel and a little bit larger than the one that's on the car uh, and that was where my drawing started so I concentrated on that and I actually made this a little bit larger than scale because it's the uh, very exciting part of the car that I wanted to emphasize. Plus it might be a little easier to carve. Now I'm carving out of curly maple. Uh, this mascot had to look like chrome and the curly maple has a reflective quality that looks like chrome. So although it was very difficult to carve, uh, it had to be carved out of curly maple. To the right, you see how I broke it up into four different parts. Uh, the wings and the, uh, and the actual uh, gazelle. And I have a locating block there to help locate these parts together. So you see uh, arrows pointing to show the process here uh, of uh, creating the mascot, which is going to fit on top of the, uh, the radiator. Re-engineering the wheels. Uh, my first drawing, which you see on the left here, was very, very complicated, and I wasn't sure I could uh, do that. So uh, the drawing to the right uh, is much simplified. And I did that drawing on, on AutoCAD, because AutoCAD could handle that very easily as an array. Uh, what I realized was really important was the turning sequence. I had to decide uh, which part needed to be turned first. So if you look at the, uh, the lathe there and you look at my uh, diagram down below, the first thing I had to do was to curve or to turn the curly maple. And then I would set that aside. And then I turn a disc, like a donut uh, of aspen that was gonna be the white, white walls, which have to wrap down into the into the wheel. And then I put the wengi on the, uh, on the lathe. I, I didn't want to take the wengi off once I put it on. So that's why I, I, I did it last. And, and then you'll see up in the right there where I took the uh, uh, aspen donut and clamped it into the wengi. And then I cut a, a pocket into the uh, aspen in order to be, that would fit the uh, uh, curly maple center part that I had already turned. And the, before I could 
fasten in the uh, curly maple, I had to insert the toothpicks. So it was quite a tricky operation to, to drill through uh, the wheel into the hub in the center uh, for each one of those toothpicks. And I soon realized that uh, the quality of toothpicks when you buy them at the grocery store is not very good. Uh, half of them were rejected and the other half were the right size. So I created a little sizing jig uh, to, uh, to get them right. This is the finished wheel. Uh, you can see the curly maple in the center and the uh, aspen for the white walls and the wingy uh, for the outside of the, uh, the wheel. And in the center of the wheel, uh, I, I had done a burn in and the wood burning shows the Chrysler uh, insignia or the, the uh, and there's the finished wheel. The uh, gentleman that I was doing this for, he came to see my progress and he got quite excited when he saw the wheel. The, uh, after considerable work in carving, I came up with the body here and you can see the, the body. And one of the things is a big concern is managing the cross grain construction. Uh, but if you look at the car, the grain is running, the length of the grain is running around the car. So all these pieces are shrinking and swelling together. So I don't have any, any uh, difficulty with cross grain construction. You'll notice the uh, rear cowl uh, I made that with uh, hand tools uh, to shape a solid block of walnut. The front cowl was a piece of book matched but walnut veneer glued to a plywood form using a, uh, a vacuum bag. And you'll notice uh, the, uh, oh, I'll come to that later. Uh, the fenders down at the lower part uh, I glued them onto the body while they were still in a block form. Uh, so then I was able to uh, blend in uh, while shaping the body. Uh, the uh, front cowl and the dashboard, uh, you can see the vacuum bag veneering here that, uh, that formed that. Uh, it's basically a, a bag plastic bag that you put the part in and then uh, uh, draw uh, a suction on it and uh, evacuate all the, all the air to pull the veneer down very tightly over the, uh, the form that I had created. And the same is the case with the, uh, uh, the front cowl. Uh, it was also formed with a, with a vacuum bag. You'll see a, a cardboard pattern on my scroll saw here. That was a, a, a pattern I laid out to show what the uh, uh, dashboard was going to look like. And you'll notice the piece of uh, uh, butternut that I selected to do the, uh, uh, the dashboard for the dials. The, there's a knot in the bottom of it. But there's a, uh, uh, if you see my yellow line that is there, uh, it shows that the grain around the knot was exactly what I was looking for. So uh, uh, that, that gave a, an interesting look to the, uh, to the dashboard. And the, uh, actually the dials for the dashboard were uh, cut with a, with a wood, with a uh, plug cutter. And then uh, uh, on the scroll saw, I cut through the, the, the blank and the uh, little dials uh, fell out and then I glued them onto the, uh, the dashboard. Now this is the, uh, the hood and it's, uh, it shows up what the, uh, uh, the veneer that I used here is the uh, book match uh, but walnut. A butt walnut has a really interesting, uh, what we call step curl. Uh, when a tree is growing and you have the uh, straight trunk coming down to the ground and then the root comes out on a curve. 
Uh, every time the tree adds more wood onto it, that wood is being a smaller and smaller radius and it has to crunch up. And in so doing that, it creates this really interesting figure that uh, you'll see in the veneer there, which we call the step curl. If you were to pass a light across that, you would uh, swear that there was heat rising off the, uh, the hood of the, of the Chrysler. In the lower picture, uh, you'll see a, a, a hole there that I uh, provides access so I can reach in and, and apply screws as required. On the uh, bottom right picture, uh, where I did wood burning to see, show the vents and the piece of wood running across is a trim, trim strip is made out of butternut, which is very characteristic look of walnut, but it's a much, a much lighter color. So it formed a contrast to the uh, walnut veneer. This is the process of uh, starting the front fenders. Uh, I had some large blocks, but I still needed to make it thicker. So I clamped the two pieces together. The trick here was trying to put the wood joint in a place where it will be the least, the least obvious. And in the lower left, you'll see uh, my use of a, of a pattern. I, I glued the paper onto a piece of plywood and that became my template for, uh, uh, for carving the uh, front fenders. Uh, here we have the rocker panels and the spare tires. Uh, to accommodate movement across the grain, the veneer trim strip around the spare tire is fastened with screws through a slot. What's, what it potentially could happen is a solid block of wall that could expand. And if I had that uh, a strip of veneer fastened in tightly, it would probably uh, crack apart. So there's a little screw at the bottom and a slot that allows for a movement of that band around that uh, wheel. This is my favorite place to carve up at the, uh, in the Muskokas. Uh, what you'll notice here is the, uh, the hold down, the, uh, uh, this part is mounted onto a uh, uh, sort of a, it's a ball that rotates so I can lock that in any position to facilitate the carving. Here I'm shaping the details by using a, a tenon saw and a, uh, and a chisel. I have a picture of the real uh, stone guard uh, that uh, will guide my way here. The uh, front wire grill, this was a challenge to decide what to do there. Uh, again, in the actual car, it's very much smaller and more complicated. Uh, so I had to find a way that would look like the, uh, uh, the car, but be something that I could carve. So I had a test block of, uh, uh, again, we're using curly maple, which is difficult to work with. So I did uh, one, two, three, four different uh, trials, and I, I ended up with number three. Because this is hard maple and curly, uh, using my little chip carving knife, I had to make several cuts in order to get one of those sections because I could only take a little bit off at, at a time. The uh, rear bumper was a, uh, a real challenge to put this together in three different sections. Uh, in the, in the uh, full scale, the bumper of the car is a quarter of an inch thick. To uh, make that into uh, a quarter scale, that would now be a sixteenth. A sixteenth would be very thin and very fragile. So if you look at the lower picture where I've turned the uh, uh, bumper upside down, along this edge, the, the wood is three eighths of an inch thick. So that gave me the strength to be able to make the top edge uh, at, at 1 16th. And it's, this uh, web here is designed to uh, support uh, again and make the uh, bumper uh, strong. Uh, the car weighed 65 pounds and I could actually grab the uh, bumper by the outside edge and lift it up 
and it was uh, very solid. So this was kind of a very interesting engineering uh, feat to be able to uh, turn the, the metal car into a wood model. Uh, the car at this point is uh, starting to look like a car. The underside, uh, we'll take a look at that. This is the uh, Lua Mahogany uh, floorboards. And it uh, shows it's put together with a, uh, a number of screws. Uh, by using the screws without glue, it would be possible to, uh, uh, to disassemble each part and, and make repairs if necessary. The headlights and driving lights, uh, these were an interesting uh, challenge to carve. Uh, you'll notice along the outside, down the side of each one of these lights, there's a raised portion. So I had to uh, carve away the background uh, on the turnings to, to give that detail. Uh, when I was turning the first headlight on my lathe, I had a, a problem with the wood uh, cracking and uh, uh, checking, and I couldn't understand what was happening. But I realized that when I was using my uh, lathe chisel as a scraper on the end grain of this uh, light, the friction was so great that it was drawing the moisture out of the block and causing it to, uh, uh, to crack. And uh, uh, so I, I did it over again and I, I learned a lesson from my uh, error and was able to uh, get them made properly. Uh, the uh, dowel running through to support these uh, driving lights uh, is uh, curly maple. And uh, I didn't know where to buy a curly maple dowel, so I had to make this on the lathe. And uh, sanding it on the lathe was, was kind of tricky. So I put it in my uh, drill press and, and it provided the perfect uh, way of sanding that spindle. Uh, these are the mahogany uh, uh, seats. The mahogany looks very much like leather. So it was the obvious choice to use for, uh, uh, for the uh, seats. And the upholstery trim uh, was uh, hand carved and, uh, and fitted in around the, uh, uh, the leather seats. The door handles, you can see how small they are. Uh, and again, they're out of curly maple. So uh, they were very carefully uh, hand carved and, uh, and then located uh, where they would go on the, on the car. And I drilled a hole where I could uh, uh, mount those. The ebony steering wheel, ebony was the perfect choice for, for this because I needed something hard and something that would have been similar to uh, the essence of, uh, uh, yeah, the essence of Bakelite, which would have probably been used at that time. Uh, there's a glue joint. I, I, I couldn't get a piece of ebony white enough, so I had to glue it. And uh, the location of the joint was very critical. And even so, when I was working on it, uh, the, uh, the grain, the short grain was, was very weak. And uh, I, I broke it at least once. And I discovered that when I was working on it uh, with files, which worked better than the knives, that I had to support it somehow to, uh, to avoid cracking it again. Uh, I was able to turn the outside edge on the, on the lathe and everything else had to be uh, hand carved or filed and sanded uh, to end up with the, uh, uh, the ebony steering wheel, which you see here. The uh, posts, corner posts of the windshield were probably the most difficult part of this whole process because that corner post had to fit the contour of the car. Uh, it had to uh, uh, tie in with the uh, uh, top edge of the windshield. Plus it had to provide the perfect location for the little uh, parking lights that you see 
uh, down on the side there. And it used several clamps here to, uh, uh, to fasten the, the windshield onto the uh, uh, cowl. There's no, uh, uh, I, I couldn't put glass in it, the windshield, so the uh, open space with the frame around it uh, reads uh, glass. The uh, wind deflectors are, were quite small. Uh, to put it together, I use uh, slip joints. And the, uh, the actual car, as you'll see in the photo on the right, it's, uh, the glass was framed on three sides. And then the exposed edge of the glass was on the outside edge. Uh, so that created a problem. Uh, how was I going to make this? Because I wasn't going to put glass in. So I, I realized I woke up in the morning early and said poplar because I had seen a, a, a block of poplar that was actually a green color. And if you look at the edge of a po polished piece of glass, uh, what color is it? Uh, it, it shows as a, as a green edge if it's highly polished. So that was my choice uh, to use a piece of green popular to uh, indicate that there was actually a piece of glass in that uh, uh, wind deflector. Now the wind deflectors are adjustable. Uh, this way uh, is kind of impressive, but they're much less likely uh, to break if they uh, are, are twisted or pivot. Up in the top right hand corner, you'll see a, uh, a photo of the, uh, uh, all the little pieces are all together. I found it makes more sense to drill and notch those parts before I cut them apart. It'd be almost impossible to deal with them as little tiny pieces. So that was something I learned in the process of making this car. Making the trunk was another uh, challenge in itself. And the, uh, uh, to simulate the covering of the uh, trunk, uh, I used the burl walnut. And I have, you'll notice here, there's a dark section of the burl and it shows up in four different places. So I, I purchased a, a flitch of walnut burl and then did a, a four piece match. Uh, over to the Right, uh, you'll see my first test piece here. That's why it's narrow to uh, be able to bend that uh, plywood panel around the form of the trunk. And I use a process called saw curfing. So by cutting a lot of little shallow uh, grooves or saw cuts into that panel, I could actually bend it over the form of the, uh, of the trunk. And then at the bottom, you'll see the uh, clamping process here of clamping that part. Uh, I use a, a couple of belt clamps and some very strong elastic bands. The uh, piece of wood that's running through the two orange belts at the top uh, wouldn't have been necessary, but I thought that uh, just for good measure, I'd make one more saw cut at the top of the, uh, of the panel. So what happened when I clamped it, it buckled up. So I had to uh, uh, rethink it and uh, uh, put that board in to, uh, to hold that down. And then the uh, uh, wingy is uh, cut with a grain running the direction I wanted it and then uh, inserted it as a square blocks. And then I filed it down after it was glued in place. The uh, license plate, uh, I, I made three of them. First, I made one in basswood because it was really easy to do the wood burning. And then I thought, no, maple would be better. So I got a piece of maple and did the wood burning. And then I was visit visiting a car shop and where they had a collection of license plates. And I realized that the license plates for 1931 were yellow. So now my maple license plate is the wrong color. So I uh, uh, found a piece of uh, Paul Amarella or yellow heart, which uh, is closer to the color of the license plate for that, that year. Uh, you'll see the, uh, the tail light here and the post for that. 
And then that little piece of uh, red wood there, uh, that's bloodwood. And you'll see in the upper right corner where I had to uh, carve out the tail light to insert that uh, uh, the red uh, glass. I used end grain for this because the end grain somehow seemed to represent the uh, uh, the tail light better than uh, edge grain or face grain. Uh, but the end grain is very fragile. And again, I, I broke that at least once and re-glued it in the process of fitting that together. Uh, here we see the, uh, the back end of the car with the trunk and the, uh, uh, and the license plate in place and the tail light. And this gives a really good example of the uh, uh, curly maple and how you can see the reflective quality. Now the, uh, uh, the latch and the hinge uh, were again, a, a challenge to, uh, to make them look realistic. And uh, on one occasion, my, my mother-in-law was looking at the car and she walked up to it and she put her fingers around the, the latch and she wanted to open it. And I said, no, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't open. Uh, but how do you tell your mother-in-law to, to back off? And she says, well, sure it does. Well, that, that actually reinforced the, the thought. I wanted it to look real. I wanted it to look like it would open and that the hinge would turn, but uh, it wasn't necessary for it to actually function. So here we are, we're almost, almost done. It is just the over to the right corner there. You'll see the roof. That's uh, uh, was the next part of the process. So here I'm making the roof. I had a long piece of basswood uh, and a block. Uh, so I have the block in the center and then two pieces along the edge. And I, I cut a 45 degree angle, uh, which now makes it possible to fold fold that up and. Uh, get the shape of the, uh, of the roof, as you see here. Uh, all I have to do now is to put the, uh, uh, the welt in, in there to make it look more realistic. So uh, these next few slides are the process of uh, uh, continuing to shape the, uh, uh, the roof with uh, various uh, uses of a saw and chisel and drill press and whatever to uh, uh, remove the material that's not necessary. And now they, uh, I had to think through how I was going to do the uh, welt to be able to cut the welt out at its finished size and, and fit it around the roof uh, was, I don't have the skill to do something like that. So uh, what I basically did was like a sandwich here uh, where I cut these very thin pieces of mahogany on the table saw Again, I, I did it on a fairly large block so that it would be safe to do. And then uh, uh, these were used to insert between the two parts of the, uh, uh, the roof when they're glued together. So you can see uh, step one, step two, step three, and then step four is the uh, final finishing up of the, uh, uh, of the, of the welt. So it looks, uh, it looks quite realistic. I was very pleased with how that finally came out. The roof struts, the uh, real car was uh, oak and I had some red oak. So it was only natural that the roof struts were made out of uh, red oak. And here is the finished car paying us a visit. As it comes in, you'll see the wheels turn and then it's going to take off to the other side of the, of the uh, screen. This is the finished car. And uh, I like the definition of integrity. It's the quality of being complete, adherence to a code of uh, moral, artistic or other values. Uh, unimpaired condition, soundness, and honesty and unity. I did everything I could to make this car, uh, every part measure up to 
to a high quality. If there's one poor part, it, uh, it damages the uh, quality of the, of the whole uh, project. And again, here we see the three views, the car uh, and the uh, lower picture show the front and the, um, and now, and now, now we have the car back in its place of honor in the uh, uh, showroom, uh, sitting beside the, uh, the original uh, 1931 Chrysler Imperial. So this, the steps in making this car, uh, preparation plus opportunity equals success. I spent a lifetime preparing and learning skills that now uh, were necessary when I had this, was able to take on this opportunity. So I was successful. Take time to plan and develop ideas. You must understand wood before you can use it intelligently. We must risk failure to know how far we can go. Failure only occurs if we quit and quality is determined by the weakest element. Concentrate on one part at a time and enjoy the process and anticipate the end product. Find a mentor and be a mentor. Lifelong learning and sharing. This is my philosophy behind the process of this car. And I often had to remind myself of some of these uh, guidelines. The material selection was uh, a crucial part of this. I, I spent dozens of hours, maybe hundreds of hours, just deciding on which piece of wood to use where. So the wood species were selected to represent the character and essence of each part and its material. I've mentioned the chrome, uh, the, the choice of wood there was curly maple, uh, walnut for the body, the engine hood, the butt walnut, uh, mahogany for the leather at trunk, and butternut for the contrasting trim. And wangi was the perfect choice for the rubber tires because it's black, but it also has light streaks running through it that look like the cotton cords that we used to be put in to reinforce the rubber back in the 1930s. The white walls are made of aspen, uh, which is a fairly white wood. And the spokes are the only off the shelf part that I used. The leather upholstery, uh, mahogany again, uh, the floorboards go on plywood, uh, bakelite for the steering wheel, uh, made out of uh, uh, ebony as as it had the required hardness, color, and texture. The glass, I mentioned before, the green uh, poplar, and the license plate and Paul Amarella, the tail light and bloodwood, the canvas roof with basswood, and the oak struts out of red oak. This is outlines the, <clears throat> the process of uh, making the car. Uh, I started with a scale drawing. Uh, all the measurements were taken from the full size 1931 Chrysler Imperial. At one point when I was looking at the car, I leaned over to touch it and the gentleman said, uh, uh, Peter, is that a zipper on your jacket? Uh, you don't get so close. So I ended up using a, uh, uh, my wife's fabric uh, or dressmaking uh, tape measure, which is made out of cloth. So by using a cloth tape measure, the gentleman was quite comfortable with me measuring the, uh, the car. Uh, many photos and sketches, uh, detailed scale drawings were made for, for each part. Uh, wood identification is an important part here. I made many cardboard mock-ups to visualize what parts were gonna look like and trial parts were made, and sometimes three or four different parts before I found the one I was looking for. And substandard materials were rejected early, and there was much machining and shaping, uh, veneer matching, uh, which is something that I learned in the uh, furniture industry, and the saw curved 
curves for the truck. There's a, uh, uh, a green edge to the glass on the rear cowl, which had a curve, so I, I uh, steam bent that part so that it would wrap around to form the, uh, uh, the windshield of the rear cowl. There's various joints. We have dowel joints, half lap, through tenons, and a, a bunch of screws. I used adhesives, uh, white glue, urea formaldehyde, and epoxy. The epoxy was necessary for the, uh, for the ebony. It was so dense that the regular glues were not effective. And I hand carved the gazelle mascot, the trunk latch, the seats, fenders, bumpers, et cetera, et cetera. And all the colors are natural wood, uh, hand sanded, rubbed with penetrating oil finish. The black lines and lettering are created with a wood burning tool. So check out Conestoga Woodworking Programs, uh, which is where I was teaching. I had the great pleasure of being able to uh, uh, present two awards every year. Uh, the, uh, the car provided the initial uh, vision for these awards and uh, partially funded them. And then uh, as the years have gone by, I've added more and more to that. So every year, uh, 14 years after I retired from the college, I am still able to present awards to students who have worked hard, achieved uh, high marks, and have a strong interest in woodworking. See, these are some quotes I'll leave with you. Uh, many times when I needed inspiration, I would uh, go to these quotes and they would, uh, uh, they would inspire me to, uh, to not give up, to keep going until the project was complete. So in the end, the gentleman I did it for was very pleased with the end result. <laughs>